First of all, thank you to Archaeology Scotland for sort of sponsoring this and allowing this session to happen. It's a very inspiring group of individuals here, organisations, etc. So I thought I'd put up inspiring words for a start. Volunteer, you can do more if you're a volunteer. And I thought, right, I then need to follow that up with an inspiring case study, perhaps, um, to talk you through what could be achieved. Uh, with that in mind, the site I've chosen is a uh, site up in uh, Royal Deeside, uh, Howard Romar. It's basically a large circular landscape bordered by uh, hills, uh, rich in archaeology, uh, still relatively poorly understood in some ways. And the site is uh, um, Black Hills, as we um, incorrectly called it. <laughs> it was the first reported by a member of the public, Mr. Ken Cooper, back in 1998. So take one for community engagement. They came and told us about this site for start. We wouldn't be here without that individual. It was a site of a feature sitting under trees. That's all we knew. So we interpreted it under a so we can probably call it a roundhouse now, obviously. But uh, and we just put it within the record. Cycle a polygon on it, gave it the site's name. Big mistake. <laughs> All of that was rubbish. There's a series of individuals I'm going to talk uh, <coughs> refer to uh, throughout this talk. The first group are the Robert Trust, the actual landowners. And because this, you know, any good story has to be um, a bad, depressing start, building a nice <laughs> end, hopefully. Uh, they came to me in November 2012. Uh, and held the hands up and went, we think we've gone and damaged an archaeological site. And I was like, thank you for being great, thank you for coming forward and confessing to that. I went out on a nice winter's day, as it were, with the snow driving through every so often, temperature just below freezing, <coughs> and confronted this quite depressing landscape. The trees which covered the circular feature first reported back in 1988 had been stripped away, there was nothing left. We're looking at that typical desert or desolate, some battlefields type landscape. And there's a question of, oh dear God, what do we do? Uh, so, looking at this as a local authority archaeologist, this is not a crisis, this is an opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> Don't panic. <laughs> the Mugrubba Trust is a, is a very forward thinking trust. Uh, conservation is at the heart of everything they do. But of course, they're also. Uh, an awful lot of private money as well, so there isn't any scheme that this was hanging off, this replanting, this forestry. There was no other hints to perhaps get commercial archaeology to sort out the issue, etc. It was a headache sitting there and we had to act fairly rapidly. Especially, uh, and this is one perhaps I should be in the landscape survey uh, uh, session yesterday for see how good people's eyes are. This is really a lost skill in terms of looking at the landscape. There is, and I'll, I'll aiding everyone here, faith of eye, there is a circular type feature there. Big, about 16 odd meters uh, internal diameter. Uh, it was a bit odd. This wasn't a hot circle in the first instance, something wasn't quite right. The banks, the spread of banks, we're looking at two, three meter spreads of banks. Uh, there was big stones happening in the center of the site. Uh, a lot of quartz everywhere. Uh, something was a little bit strange. So immediately, still happy it's a prehistoric site, but I'm really not sure what we're actually looking at. And you look at it, there's a linear bank there. To give you an idea of the, uh, uh, I, kind of, I always think about the, the, the driver of the forestry vehicle at the time. It's a fair old roller coaster going over these banks. <laughs> uh, and he obviously enjoyed it. He did it a further five times. Uh, uh, so he really destroyed this site. He had a real good go at it. Um, so it's now exposed. Uh, uh, the stratigraphy is showing in some way, but it's also presenting more questions. You can see there's a bit of internal coursing but it's not a true wall. Uh, like I said, there's, there was other things happening, far stonier than we were thinking. And one eye thinking of the opportunity looking forward is that this depressing site, and it does get nicer, this is just along from Queen Victoria's one of her great uh, London viewing points. It is a beautiful, on a beautiful day. Uh, on a nearing winter, it was a case of, right, Come spring, this is a photograph taken later uh, um, in sort of spring last year, so a few months later. I know it's going to be thick with vegetation, so we're not even going to be able to see 
uh, uh, good archaeology that we know is lying across the site. And therefore, we thought of the Northeast uh, Archaeological Research Society, uh, NESARS, um, a very enthusiastic uh, community group, um, not perhaps a typical demographic. They are mixed ranges. They are not on the cusp of perhaps you're fearful that they may not survive the day. <laughs> uh, they, they are a lot younger generation coming through. They're using social media. They're engaging in a different way. They are looking actively for partnerships, for projects to do. It's like, great, we want to take that enthusiasm and we want to do something with it. I have a perfect project here that I can marry up with that enthusiasm and hopefully deliver something good. But it's only going to need a little bit of funding from us. I'm in a lucky and nobody with local authority of various cuts, etc. I actually have a budget still. Um, shh, don't tell my budget. Um, so I engaged with them. I offered them this site and said, oh, before we look at the actual site, I want to understand this wider landscape. There are other things happening with across the area that's been clear fell. And with that, we then uh, asked them to do an intensive grid survey of the site itself, simply because of the uh, difficulties of the terrain, and then linear field walking across the rest of the area. And I didn't I really didn't know what to expect. You have you set out with these projects with community engagement with the best hope in the world. And I have to say, every expectation was exceeded. I cannot stress that enough in terms of everything. For instance, they came to me with the risk assessment. They came to me with tower gate insurance in place. Things like that. We then got, and I'm trying to work it out, um, it was, I think, in total, 180 volunteers worth of days spent field walking across this site and looking at this in detail. A huge amount of work. And they were doing it, uh, asking me how they want to record it, how best to deliver the results. Huge, huge, uh, hugely impressive and very encouraging. And they were wanting more, and that's the key thing. They wanted to up their game from just perhaps the usual run of the mill. They wanted to be achieving more professional standards. So they went into you know, detailed recording sheets, started finding other features, other piled up cans, linear banks. Um, they found worked quartz. They could identify work quartz and challenge a lot of uh, professional archaeologists to do that. Beaker pottery, there's a, I haven't actually got an image of it, unfortunately, but a flint arrowhead as well. Some people were getting really good diagnostic uh, dating evidence for this site and across the area. Beyond that, they were, they were like I say, wanted a better uh, expertise, as it were. So the first lot was the Abney University. We got them involved. There's a little bit. The local authority of our role here is a sort of Machiavellian, I'll make these partnerships, I'll get these people stuck on one, in one room or stuck on a site somewhere and make it work. And that's all uh, a key figure, sort of the background is how I see myself in this. And the Abbey University came along and started helping them actually do a detailed survey of the main feature itself. That wasn't enough. They wanted to learn how to do it themselves, which is then when they brought on David here, Pastor Ivan Strip Badger, with a great project as well. <clears throat> and so David then taught them how to do how to take the survey work themselves. And they went back and then did more work across the site itself. Suddenly you're having detailed landscape survey. Far more hours and resources put in than any commercial research uh, excavation we put in within the course of a few months. And very impressive results. And this is a, another example of some of the work producing. This is uh, artifact scatters, thinking about um, the types of finding that they're getting, noticing concentrations of quartz, noticing concentrations of other types of geologically different material clumping together across the site. They actually, one of their contacts in the community was a retired geologist. Let's then get them out and looking at this stuff. Some of you have another layer of expertise that we may struggle to bring to the table sometimes ourselves. So very detailed results, and at that point, I went, right, this is a really quite special site. Still don't know what it is, but we hold my hands up that. We're still using the roundhouse tag, but different. Uh, <laughs> so the next thing is, wait for a nice sunny day and get a, uh, uh, an academic like uh, Richard Bradley and a Manticore <coughs> on the site and persuade them, worst case scenario, you can enjoy 
with beautiful views for three weeks. <laughs> but there's something interesting here. It ties in with previous research which Reading University have done in the past in the area down at Tom the Berry Stone Circle, which is not far away from Walk Mill, another stone circle uh, with an Iron Age cemetery uh, in addition, various other uh, roundhouses in the area we never really looked at, never really understood the connections and, and uh, cross reference. So, sold the concept to, to Richard. Um, I will fund your excavation to a certain degree. And I think probably the spirit of the volunteers, the community demand effort that gone in, helped because then somebody's like, yes, just cover my expenses, we'll use volunteers and engage with the community and run with this as a voluntary project otherwise. That volunteering doesn't need to just sit within the community. We can all take part in that. And I think it's a very key aspect. If we want, if we expect them to be professional, sometimes we have to be expected to be volunteers. I think Murray and Fiona have done an excellent job of illustrating that. Uh, within the Sterling area. So fast forward, um, here we are in September of last year, um, volunteers working on site, uh, three weeks all together, um, we got very, very lucky, beautiful weather the whole time. Um, and the site, as you can see, is a bit complicated. There was stuff coming out. One great massive stone in place, nice socket. <coughs> Socket hole, something bigger, <coughs> sitting in between this upright stone, a fallen monolith with a, from this socket uh, to one side. Uh, we have a cairn material sitting in the centre, and then this outer ring of, of stones there. And basically, what we had was a brand new recumbent stone circle, which is, I must admit, Taking Richard Bradley, one of our leading experts in stone circles, putting him on an unknown site and he found a stone circle. I was suspicious. <laughs> 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 is, this a, is this a cunning plan to get a new publication? Hang on. Yeah. But no, the evidence was stunning. It's one which has obviously been rolled out, but it's got a ring cairn to it, we've got in situ uh, cremation piles uh, there as well, we've got a couple of other features. Um, the sequencing we can probably hopefully get firm dates for for the very first time. We've got 13,000 pieces of recovered quartz from the centre of the structure. <clears throat> it is one of the highest and largest to have been found. It is a beautiful view from it across to Loch Nagar itself. It's a beautiful view. You stand where the recumbent was. You just want that watershed of going over the hills. And you see a very famous peak at the middle top of the Benny Hume complex, just peeking over in between a little crack and <coughs> behind the board people, so considered behind the recumbent stone circle. Beautiful landscape setting, it all makes sense. This is an important monument. And you can imagine the sense of pride that the community volunteers will have. This is what they've been delivering within that. But it doesn't stop there, because you then start to think, Okay, stone circle, missing stones, where are they? <coughs> and you've got dry stained dikes everywhere across this landscape. <coughs> Again, I'm just showing off the view from the site across to uh, Loch Nagar and, and the beauty of the area. And again, this is where the community involvement really paid off. They went and spoke to one of the oldest surviving locals in the area, who actually probably just lived just down the hill. And in an interview, which she might not be willingly given to perhaps an academic coming in, have a Richard and don't give her Richard and her not very well. <laughs> this is awesome. Um, <clears throat> but she says, I remember as a child playing with my sister at the stone circle at the top of the hill. Um, ring of standing stones to describe some sort of uh, sort of thigh height, uh, so quite low down, etc. But a distinct ring, a distinct stone circle. Uh, how on earth have we missed that? And I'm of Mostly antiquarians are going to blame for this, as opposed to us. <laughs> but for hundreds of years, everyone has been spotting every other stone circle in the area. Everyone, this particular bit, we've walked past, we've ignored it, we've never got to that particular bit of the landscape. But the local knowledge is still there, the oral tradition is key to it. And from her description, we can actually start to in identify individual stones, where they were placed in the, the dikes. And this is, we think it's removed late. Mid 1940s, late 1940s. I think it might have been during um, forestry operations for the land improvement for the production of new timber 
uh, during the Second World War would think. We're still working on this, and this is, like I say, very much a work in progress uh, going forward. But we now know where the stones went. And that's something that's a huge, instead of us guessing in the landscape, local knowledge is guiding us straight to it. And also, one of the best quotes I've heard for a while from someone what kind of field gank <laughs> would have planted trees in a stone circle? And uh, for you, field gank and got it, sort of what mad idiot, as it were. But that's the sort of local feeling about this site, you know. Why would you get rid of a stone circle? <laughs> um, so suddenly we have this extra depth to what we're looking at. So what did we achieve with that? <coughs> Fantastic new find, but setting aside, I'd have been happy still with the level of detail that went on, if that was a post medieval sheepfold in the end, with a bit of strange stuff going on, uh, what really came out of it was the partnership working. The McRobert Trust, the community group, the universities, the commercial sector, all coming together and delivering huge amounts of benefit for very little cost. And because we were talking a little bit before about justifying cost, what it all means. I think I have spent, budgeted about £5,000 just under in total to this point. Um, everyone else has been, and specialist reports, etc., have been done for free. These are favours that break. I'm going to owe an awful lot of beers. I might just put Murray's uh, debt to me back onto them and just clean out the equation. <laughs> um, and it is a bit, that spirit of volunteering is, is spreading across, and everyone wants to be involved in this. I'm trying to, to, to work out how much I think, and at the moment um, I'm still working on the figures, but I think for every pound of public money, proving that public money that I'm spending is beneficial, it's probably a happy equivalent of about another £10 worth being added to it. Um, roughly, that's the rough figures at the moment. They are set to spiral upwards because of what's coming next. So, like I say, far more detailed survey than we could have ever expected on a normal site. Major research questions, what is this, what is it, the wider landscape, how is it delivered, all of that achieved in a very tight time scale, it was essentially within one year. Increased research questions leading on from that as well. And I think probably beyond that, it's not just stopped there, that's not a dead project, we're talking about sustainability in Brendan. Uh, we now have that site, the landowners and the global trust are now in the process of negotiating uh, of bringing how to actually uh, reinstate, safeguard that site, now taking out of forestry, formation of car park, formation of uh, access and interpretation, some of the community want this to be part of a wider set of uh, heritage trails around the village of Thailand itself, somebody is looking at other research projects in the area, they want to keep going with this, they want each bit to be seed funded and pushed forward from there. A really nice, huge amounts of work with very little input from my point of view. Again, that Machiavellian maneuvering in the background to help them where I can. And it's never very wish list with a very skilled set of volunteers. And that's the question. How much should we expect our volunteers, our communication, how ex experienced should we uh, expect them to be? After all, as a profession, we have grown. We have childhood status now. Can we perhaps ask these people who are doing it as a hobby, some of them want to do it at quite a high level. Is it unreasonable to offer them the skills when they are seeking for it? And you get the results. We shouldn't be afraid of that. Um, so finally, um, that's a list of people that I want to thank. They are hugely, as a partnership working with the academic, commercial, community. But this is a list that's going to keep on growing. And the Royal Commission, I don't know if a, a group that's been added on to that, um, Adam Welfare, uh, with the leading expert on the recumbent stone circles, is currently advising on the best way of uh, 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 protecting and going forward and reinterpretation of it. Um, I have a provost uh, who cannot wait to open a brand new stone circle. How many times should she or anyone be able to do that? Uh, so, some of the councils with their photo opportunities, they're lining up as well. The good news story keeps going. And on that very positive note, I'd like to say thank you.